part of Calgary Catholic School District with 54,000 students, almost 110 schools next year, and over 5,000 staff. And that's why we have so many with us today. We want to tell our story from St. Timothy's perspective. And uh, it's been a real interesting journey. I know the team last year uh, uh, set the stage for us to better respond to the students in our building. And not just students, uh, uh, First Nations students, but all students. And one of the things I want to focus on today is good practice is good practice. And meeting kids where they're at is what we need to do in all cases. So we've seen some success around that. But before I go too far, I just want to introduce the team here to present to you today. We have Susie Olson, who's one of our LA teachers. Susie can raise your hand. Where is she over there? Oh, hey, Susie's in the back. We couldn't even get her on the stage. There's so many of us. Keith Ruche is our trades. Uh, he's our welding and uh, our um, uh, woods gentleman. He works with the kids in the shop, and we've had a lot of impact with our students in that regard. We have Lori Mayer, who's our foods and fashion teacher, and we're doing a lot of cultural type activities in the uh, foods lab. The nice part about that is not only for the kids that are getting to create the beadwork and such, but the other kids being exposed to the traditions, the, the First Nations traditions, which we're really proud of. Next, we have Lori Breakspear, who's our literacy lead, and she's one of our diverse learning teachers. And with her elementary, junior high background, we are in a high school setting. She was able to see really quickly that many of our students uh, were you know, having gaps in their education, especially in the area of literacy. So she's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how we focus on literacy and how that is the key to students' futures. And we've had grade 10, grade 11 kids that sometimes are reading at a grade two, three level, and sometimes we find them in high school classes, and then we wonder why their attendance drops and they're not engaged. So really being purposeful in how we actually connect with kids, being flexible and trying to understand them. Trish Canafani is one of our uh, educational assistants, and she's the lady that helps us with, with food. And as we know, food is very much uh, uh, more than just food. It's about welcoming people into our community. So we started a very comprehensive food program Everyone thinks there's a lot of money out in Cochrane, but you'd be surprised the amount of kids that do not come to school each day fed. And without fuel, they don't go too long during the day and they can't learn. Wanda First Rider is our culture liaison from the district. Uh, Wanda, Wanda works with all of the students in Calgary Catholic, and uh, many of you know Wanda. I had the uh, privilege of running into her brother this morning, and I don't even think he knew she was coming today. So it's a chance for you guys to reconnect. Cindy Stefanato, she's our consultant, First Nations uh, FNMI consultant, and, and Cindy, Cindy brings a, a perspective to, to our large district around residential schools and, and some of the teachings her grandmother shared with her. And I believe that's the team. I want to talk a little, oh, Susan McClellan, how can I forget Susan? She's the uh, longtime uh, counselor who has this window into Stony Nakoda and she's built such amazing relationships with many of our students and we know that it's through relationships that we are allowed to do the work we do. If the kids don't trust us, they don't want to be a part of the school and the conversation. So she's done a fabulous job in that area and she's going to talk to you a little about her strategies and some of the support she provides, not just to our First Nation students but to all students. So I want to talk to you a little bit about our journey. Last year was sort of laying the groundwork and the big part for us was what are we going to do to embrace our students coming from Stony Nakoda? Uh, and you know, the team last year, this is my first year at the school, had done some wonderful work in embracing strategies that were really opening the door to kids meeting them where they're at. And I really want you to keep that in mind. One of the things through High School Redesign we're looking at this year is flexibility in meeting kids where they're at. That is our focus this year. And they're gonna speak a little bit more to how we do that. We want an authentic educational experience. We wanna acknowledge the history. We also want to have the bar set high so that students can graduate and be successful. Creating a community inclusive to all students. And you know, easier said than done sometimes. We know that kids sometimes can be mean to other kids and it's usually a lack of knowledge. It's some of the perceptions they have. So lots of what we do is dispelling myths and actually making sure that students are held accountable to be respectful of each other. And that's a big part of our Catholic uh, community. 
as well as just, you know, learning spiritually some of the things our First Nations uh, teachers teach us here at the school. High school redesign I talked about, well this is a new endeavor for us. I know there's some folks in this room that probably have a lot more experience in this area. But really high school redesign is something that uh, the Alberta, Alberta Education is looking and it's, you know, our district is uh, full force on this. Really about meeting kids where they're at. How do we engage kids so they can be successful? How do we modify? How do we uh, accommodate? How do we explore new strategies so kids can be met where they're at? and go forward and be successful. It's about, about creating success together. And then finally, you know, one of the things we really thought a lot about, and last year I think it started with the cultural piece, but is looking at the spiritual, social, emotional, academic, and the wellness needs of all students. And you're gonna hear the team talk about that. And I think it's really important that we are specific in those areas because failure to focus on any one will not give us the opportunity to be successful in any of it. So. And again, I started with good practice is good practice. You're going to hear those stories today. And I'm going to pass it over to Trish. I'm just going to fire through my slides. And like Solange said, you'll get these slides a little later. But uh, I covered most of what's on here. So Ms. Canafani, please come forward. Thank you. Great part about being six. <laughs> okay, so I've been with Calgary Catholic District for a long time. This is my first year at St. Timothy's. When I came this year, I noticed that many of our students were not eating breakfast, in some cases um, because of their very long bus commute that they would have. So we observed that obviously this impacted negatively the students' ability to focus on their studies. We started a small program at first to see the response from the students would be by providing just some easy to eat food items. So we put out a basket and in the basket we'd have simple things. We'd have um, apples and bananas and then Cobb's bread and Cochran would donate to us foods such as muffins and sweet breads, that sort of thing, and pastries. The response from the students was very positive. Uh, they loved it and would uh, express what they liked and didn't like and what they wanted to see in the basket the next day. Uh, from an educational perspective, teachers noticed a difference in the students' focus and energy in the classroom almost immediately, and they, uh, they commented on that a lot. From this, another positive outcome has been the improved attendance for many of the students. As well as meeting a basic need, obviously the food symbolized a coming together. It was sort of a celebration of the beginning of the day, a start of the day. It was a really nice way for them to start. At St. Timothy's, we continue to engage the Cochrane community, and most recently, we have volunteers from St. Mary's Parish who have started coming into our school twice a week on Mondays and Wednesdays, providing a hot breakfast to the kids. So they might come in with a crock pot with hot oatmeal, porridge, that sort of thing, and the kids love it. All right, thank you. Next, we're gonna just touch on literacy and get into the curriculum and the cultural aspects. Hi, good morning. I'm Lori, and as Steve mentioned, I'm one of the diverse learning teachers at St. Timothy School. Um, this year we've taken on as a school, sorry. This year we've taken on as a school an, for an initiative to improve literacy overall with all of the kids. In September when the year began, we, we, we started by looking at the lists of diverse learners that we had and the kids that were currently struggling. We quickly realized that um, there, was a, there was a need in the school uh, across all areas and all grade levels with all kids coming into the building. And being my first year here, I was told that it has been increasing the kids coming in. There was more and more need and then it was evident that there needed to be um, a program designed specifically to, um, to address those needs. So the program that we established, we, we started, is... Um, is the Fontes and Pinnell Literacy Intervention System, which some of you may be familiar with. It is it's a district approved resource and one that's um, quite highly suggested to be used throughout the district. Typically, and, and initially, it's more of, uh, was more of an elementary program, but as its um, popularity has grown and in the success they've had with it, they've since rolled out more components to the program that's designed, that would designed specifically for kids um, Div 2 and up, so grades 6 through 12. So uh, we were very fortunate in our school at St. Timothy to um, get a hold of, for lack of a better word, 
uh, great amounts of these resources that we could start in uh, this program. How it looked was, as I had mentioned, we took the diverse learner list, and then as the weeks in school began to unfold, there were more and more names coming forward of children that could uh, look like they could use the support in reading, reading comprehension, writing, and, and cross language in general. So logistically, it wasn't without its struggles in terms of how you how you implement a reading intervention program within a junior high high school setting because you have scheduling that's vastly different, looks vastly different than in an elementary classroom. So uh, having said that, it, we spent some time, we worked out some kinks, some kinks still to be worked out. The program is designed to be a small group intensive reading intervention program for kids who are um, two and three grade levels below where they're where their same age peers are. Um, it's designed to be in a perfect world four or five days a week, and in, in some cases I have several groups that do just that. It has grown um, such that I have three support staff members at school who are off, also offering these groups, and we see students from grade seven straight through to grade 11, uh, and the kids are grouped uh, specifically on their reading level where they are. So there was lots of pre-work, doing uh, assessments and evaluating kids and finding out where they best, where they were best grouped. And so we schedule it such that the kids aren't coming so much out of math and in order of science and trying to accommodate them as best they can so that they're not, they can reap the rewards of having a um, small group intensive intervention program without it affect, further affecting the rest of their academics by missing more class time. So we have probably, we have currently maybe 15 groups of three or four or five students um, going on throughout the building on any given day at our school. Some of the successes that we have seen aren't, aren't just within my group and within the other staff members groups in terms of the objective the objective uh, changes that we see in increasing in their reading levels, it, it spans across all of, their, all of their courses and in all of their classes. Teachers are noticing more engagement, more confidence. Um, it's evident that the kids need this, that it's valuable and um, very useful for all of them, not just First Nations students because the group includes kids from all different parts of the building and all different communities. So it's something that I think that it's in its infancy really at the school and we'd like to see it grow even, even further. Like I said, there are some, um, some logistics that we still have to work out, but overall it's been, it's been a great success. The kids really, really enjoy coming to the program. There's lots of discussion around it. The, the information that the kids learn, not just in terms of word study and improving comprehension of what they're reading, but just the material that the, the resources offer. So it's really, really nice to see, and we hope that we're just going to continue to build on that and, and work towards you know, growing that program in whatever way we can. So part of what uh, Lori wants to maybe share, just quickly if you read, these are some of the students' uh, testimonials, and it's just nice to hear from the kids. Uh, you know, it's one thing that, to think we're doing a great job, but to hear from them and, you know, just how empowering it has been for our students in all grades and all classes. So. Susie, maybe you could just speak to this about those writing folders quickly. I know you're at the back of the room and I'm going to throw you under the bus here, but she came up with such a creative idea in regards to how we engage kids and uh, I'm just going to ask her just quickly to speak to it. Sorry about that. Good morning. I teach junior high, so I probably don't need a microphone. Um, so one of the things that we looked at, and I think that this is what speaks to with the literacy program, is how do we continue to weave in the culture for our students and for the benefit of all students. And so I've found a lot of resources um, through a few different companies and Native Reflections that we've been able to weave in and find funding for, again, just to help all of our students um, get a better understanding of the culture and as a representation throughout our building that um, these students and their history does matter to us and it's important to share all those strengths with 
the other students in our building. So we now do have some pretty beautiful, I will say, writing folders that cover the regular curriculum in terms of the expectations, but they have um, some wonderful pieces of the culture interwoven with them. And it's really made a difference in terms of the students feeling more welcomed even just in their regular classroom. So again, just a few more perspectives from students and just, you know, testimonials are so important for us to determine if we're actually meeting the need. You know, it's so nice when kids say to you, you know, I see a lot more stuff going around my culture being shared in the school and I see the other kids understanding me better. And you know, it's all about building that community. So it's really been a, uh, an exciting uh, endeavor. And a lot of, in a lot of cases, you know, it's kids driving this too. We use the Tell Them For Me survey like many school districts and it's the kids telling us they want more of this and we're trying to do everything we can to be receptive to that and build it into our school plans and, and, and elsewhere. So I'm going to call Ms. McClelland up, Susan. Susan's our counselor. She's been at St. Timothy's, I won't tell you how many years, but for a very long time. And she shares a very unique perspective on supporting our kids uh, in all... Uh, well, in all cultures. Good morning. The drum song this morning talked about honor as a way of living. I think I have the privilege of working with a group of people, the adults and the children in the building, who do that honoring, and a special privilege to work with our First Nations children. I am well supported by our DL team. I am well supported by Amber Dawn, who's a district person, family liaison, not able to be with us this morning. Also by Wanda, part of our cultural support team, of course, admin and all of our staff. And as Steve mentioned, I get to that window into Stony Nakoda that continues to lift its blinds to me every day in lots of conversations with the young people and now more and more this year with their families. Their moms and their dads are feeling much more welcome in our school and they, they come in. They, they, they drop in, even though it may be an hour away. Some of our young people catch that bus at 5 to 6 in the morning. The other thing that happens for them as a Stony Nakoda nation that we certainly notice for our young people is that their lives continue to be impacted by tragedies within the nation and how every family is linked to every other family. And then when they call someone a sister, a cousin, or a grandparent, I know when I ask them my understanding of that, they kind of look at me and think, well, what do you mean, why are you asking me that question? Some of the things we've done in terms of Pathways for Success are we've uh, worked with the NAPI program at uh, the University of Calgary, the Native um, Ambassador Post-Secondary Initiative. Our young people were involved with that. Next year, we're looking at bringing in the Tradeswind program, which is the First Nation Apprenticeship program. We're also looking, as we have grad in a couple of weeks here, we have um, representatives from our Cree Nation, the Stony, Nation, Stony Peoples, and the Métis, who will be recognized at our grad. And also, looking ahead for next year, we're looking at feeling that we need to um, access more our post-secondary people. And the other thing we're looking at is certainly just, a, um, we're not sure, a program Certainly if that involves part of outreach and more in terms of making our, of even honoring our First Nation children more. Thank you. The next piece, I'm just going to call uh, Wanda First Rider forward. And Cindy, if you'd like to join Wanda and just talk about some of the cultural pieces that uh, we uh, bring into the school and how that's engaged our students and made them feel welcome. So I'm just going to pass it over to these ladies. Okay, um, good morning. I'm a Wustache. Danse. Anidata. I work with um, all of the um, Treaty 7 tribes, the Metis, and the Inuit students within the Catholic School District. And I'm out at um, St. Timothy two days a week. And I always tell uh, my colleagues from St. Timothy that I feel, I always feel welcome. And I feel that our FNMI students are in good hands at that school. I've been working with uh, uh, Nakoda students for quite a number of years. 
I work at, also work at the junior, um, the elementary school at Holy Spirit, and I've uh, walked with the elementary students to junior high and high school at St. Timothy. Some of these students I've known since they were in um, grade two, and I've worked in the Catholic school district for 29 years. Throughout the years that I've been working at uh, St. Timothy, we've brought in speakers from the Stony Nakoda, and I see Sykes Powderface here. He's uh, one of the resource people that we've brought into the school, and he shared their way of life with St. Timothy School. Uh, when I work with the students, we've done numerous um, projects together. When I meet with the students, I ask them, what do you want to do this school year? And at the beginning of the year, we have a list that we go through and um, we cross out things that we can do and some of the things that we can't do. Last year, we focused on um, powwow dance. And I don't know if some of you know me, but I come from a powwow family and my family is quite successful in the powwow world. And um, so these students knew that and wanted me to help them to learn the powwow. So we did that last year and it was quite successful. This year we changed our focus and we are working, we're doing powwow regalia making. And I, was, I went to the principal and Susan here, and I told them I'd like to start a program for the students, but I'd like the students to get their credits, high school credits for them. Without hesitation, Mr. P uh, told me, go talk to Susan, let's do it. And Susan filled out the forms, and the students that are doing the regalia making are earning high school credits for regalia making, which I was really happy about. So for the, <clears throat> and this is the kind of um, um, work that I do with the school. They don't hesitate when I ask them, when I'm voicing the students' needs, they're always willing to try something new. For the girls that I'm working with, um, we're doing, um, fancy dance, jingle, and traditional regalia making. And what I did with the girls is we, we smudged. I brought in their family members, and their family members shared the meaning of the various dance styles that uh, we were making. Um, what I shared with them was what I know from um, the various dance uh, dance areas, and um, what I intertwined into the dance, the regalia making is the cultural and the spiritual part of our, our way of uh, dance. I also uh, share with the girls in our group their role as women, and they share with me and teach me a lot of their way of life as uh, Stony Nakoda. My way of working with these students is um, I build a lot of relationship with these students and I make it a point to call their families and get to know their families. And as I mentioned, I've uh, worked with a lot of them since they were in grade two, so I know many of the families from Stony Nakoda. And uh, I teach them Blackfoot and they teach me Stony. And they laugh and they say, oh, you sound like Washita. Oh, and they laugh and I tell them, oh, you say this in Blackfoot. And they say it and they tell me, oh, I tell them, oh, you sound like Napikwan. That's the white people. <laughs> so we, we laugh and we share, we learn words from Stony Nakoda and they learn Blackfoot words from me. I really enjoy working with these students. They know a lot about their way of life and, um, they share a lot. 
Um, another project that we worked on this year was um, a couple of the grade eight students went to their gym teacher and said that they would like to teach their grade eight class to dance. And again, without hesitation, the gym teacher said that he would be happy to do that. So we, I found a video on um, YouTube called Pow Wow Sweat, and I showed the girls, and they were very, very um, excited about it. So last Thursday, we did the um, Pow Wow Sweat with the grade eight class, and um, the grade eight students were really enthused about it, and um, the girls that taught the class shared their way of life, their dance, their language with their fellow, fellow students. And those are just a few of the things that we do at St. Tim's. Cindy Stefanatos, our consultant, and she's got the district perspective. She's gonna share a few things and then I'm gonna call uh, Mr. Rucci up and uh, Ms. Mary to finish. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Steve was saying, I have our district perspective because I work for instructional services. So um, first, I just wanted to apologize. My supervisor was planning to be here this morning, but he had um, some a family challenge. He lost somebody close in his family recently, so he wasn't he wasn't able to attend. But he really wanted to come. Um, so I'm just quickly going to tell you um, sort of what our support looks like for Saint Timothy. Um, what happens is we have requests for support come in, and I personally look through them to determine which team would best be able to support our students to make sure that we have wraparound service for all of our students. We deploy staff, so Wanda and Amber Dawn, who's the in-home support worker who's assigned to St. Tim, come from our department, so we have taken a look at St. Tim and determined that they could use that support, so we put them into St. Tim so that we can support them the best way that we can. Um, we do a lot of consultative work, so we communicate quite a bit with the school. They'll give us a shout and just say, you know, here's kind of what's happening. What do you think might be an approach that we might be able to take, and how do we be culturally sensitive about this and that sort of thing. So we just try to support them the best that we can in those ways. What I love about our relationship is that it's very interactive, so we communicate quite a bit, and we talk about what their needs are versus what our needs are and try to find a way to meet in the middle so that we can best support the kids because in the end we try to do just what's best for kids. I'm going to hand you off to Ms. Mayor. And Mr. Ruche. So this is a, a new initiative this year. It's been an exciting opportunity. And we think of the trades and the opportunities that exist for some of our students. They're going to just tell the, the specialized things they've been doing in their classrooms. And we'll end there. Okay, thank you. I just have a couple of stories to tell you today on the fashion scene and as well as the food scene. So in fashions, Wanda approached me at the beginning of the year and said she had two students interested in making regalia, and I agreed, and then I just, I had no idea. Was it a dress? Was it a costume? Um, I, so for me, it's been a learning experience as much as it has been for the children. Um, so just on the, in the curriculum area of CTF with the new curriculum, um, Career and Technology Foundations for the junior highs, um, I usually allow my students to do one major project that is of importance to them. So one of the students had decided the, rega the regalia was going to be her major project. And she just got really into sewing. And one day her parents showed up, her sister showed up at school. They just wanted to know where she goes every day to do this sewing. And she ended up sewing um, pennies that were wrecked for the gym. She ended up sewing um, costumes for the Christmas play. So just like the change that I'd seen in the student who had been in my class for two years prior, who I'd never really talked to, who I didn't really make a relationship with, I was finally able to sit down one-on-one -on -one and find out her story. So she had gone to powwows when she was younger, and then her um, regalia was too small. So in the last couple of years, she hadn't been able to go to powwows, and she had asked some family members to make her one, and no one had come forward to make her one. So just like the story that it just touched me that she had no one to make her regalia and it was finally um, her turn to do it for herself. So just like the pride that she showed, just as it's coming together now, it's, it's really cool. Um, on the food side of things, um, Susan came to me again at the beginning of the year, how about we do a class called lifestyle food? Um, so the students in my class, after teaching for 13 years, this was probably one of the biggest challenging classes I've ever had. Um, 
a student with Down syndrome, one grade seven student who was reading at a grade four level, one grade 12 student who could have been in a grade 12 class, but he was excited because he got to cook every day, didn't have tests, didn't have marking, so he just wanted to be there. Um, two grade 12 students who are graduating, but they're not gonna go on to university or um, college, and they just they need to learn to cook for themselves. And so it was a very challenging class, how we got to bring everybody together and um, with our four First Nation students and how they kind of from grade seven to 12 were able to work together as a group and how we had some um, elders come in and teach us about some traditional cooking and it just turned out to be like one of my favorite classes. Hi, Tanji, bonjour, good morning. Uh, I've been told I have two minutes so I'll try and keep this quick. <laughs> so the approach or philosophy we take in the shop at St. Timothy, uh, I teach carpentry and welding grades 7 to 12, is using the shop as a place for student engagement. <clears throat> and that starts with making it a safe and accepting place. Once students feel safe and accepted there, I see a big pickup in their work ethic. It's a place that they want to be, they actually want to come to school, whereas before school was, eh. I mean, welding, your assignment is to melt things together. There's nothing that's not fun about that for a teenage boy. Uh, so we do a lot of hands-on learning and with the high school redesign giving them the liberty to choose their own project It's something meaningful for them uh, really engages them a lot more uh, Also myself having grown up hunting and trapping in northern Alberta uh, We've got a, an exciting opportunity coming up in June 21st Aboriginal day uh, We're gonna teach the kids how to make fleshing poles and fur stretchers uh, teach them about trapping uh, just reconnecting with nature and the land and having a respect for that traditional way of life. Um, look, really looking forward to that. So that's, uh, yeah, one new initiative we're trying this year, but it's a really great way to connect with the kids and just teaching them trades and some employability skills. So, hi, hi. <laughs> Thank you.